Good afternoon. First of all, let me, uh, let me thank all of you uh, for taking time out of your busy schedules uh, to be here today, particularly uh, in light of the fact that it finally seems to be turning a little bit warmer. Maybe spring is in the air, but once again, want to thank all of you uh, for uh, participating in this edition of the Robert uh, Mill Labor Management Institute uh, lecture series and discussion. Uh, today we have a very, very timely topic uh, for your consideration, and it has to do with the crisis in the public sector uh, dealing with pensions and the, the financing and funding of that. But before we um, introduce not only our discussion, but also today's speakers, I want to take this opportunity once again to welcome you. My name is Alex Johnson, and I'm proud to serve the Community College of Allegheny County as its president. Uh, in our audience, we have um, a number of uh, dignitaries, but one I want to uh, identify in particular is one of our great uh, Allegheny County Councilman, Mr. John DeFazio. Uh, Johnny, would you please stand and receive a well-deserved round of applause. I want to share with you um, just one tidbit about uh, CCAC. Uh, this past Monday, we had the opportunity to dedicate the newest building uh, here at the Allegheny campus. It is the uh, Science Center, named in honor of uh, the Honorable K. Uh, Leroy Irvis. And I know that many of you in our audience today are familiar uh, with his legacy and his contributions, not only to this great city, uh, but to the Commonwealth in general. Uh, Mr. Irvis was uh, critical uh, to the establishment of the community college system in our state and also uh, the creation of the uh, designation for Pitt, uh, Penn State, and other institutions as what we call state-related institutions. He was an advocate of inclusion and diversity. He was a proponent of health care reform, particularly for young children, but he also was committed uh, to the rights of workers. And uh, we want to make sure that people uh, like the Honorable um, Irvis uh, continue to uh, be mindful and important to us as we move forward uh, in our endeavors. So with that, let me take this uh, opportunity to bring uh, to the podium the distinguished uh, chair of our Board of Trustees, uh, Ms. Amy Koontz. Thank you, Dr. Johnson, and welcome to everyone today. As Dr. Johnson said, I have the pleasure of serving as the chair of the board of CCAC's trustees, but in my day job, I am a senior vice president for PNC Institutional Investments. So I get the pleasure of hearing one of today's speakers, Stu Hoffman, on a regular basis. And I have to tell you that everywhere I go and people make the connection, they will tell me that they have recently heard Stu speak and that they can't believe how funny he is for an economist. So I'll let all of you non-bankers in on a little secret. We do actually require that all of our economists spend one weekend a month at the Funny Bone. I think it's uh, next weekend if you, if you want to see Sue out of context. When I saw the topic for today's event, I thought to myself, increased demands, decreased revenue. Is there any sector of the economy where that's not a relevant topic today? Um, so while we focus on the public sector for today's uh, event, I'm sure that there's a wealth of information for all of us to take away, regardless of the sector that you represent. So without further delay, let me have the pleasure of introducing the namesake for our event, uh, Bob Mill. As I understand it, Bob retired on Monday of this week and has been partying nonstop since that moment. So I'm thrilled that he has had the time to, uh, to stop for a moment for a more serious topic. We are so proud to call Bob an alumni, uh, a chair of our board, uh, a distinguished donor and friend, and it's great to have you here today, Bob. Thank you.
Well, hello. Thank you, everybody, for being here. You, you honor us. Uh, you honor me by your presence. And uh, I think you will be happy with today's, today's business. Uh, just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, you will see individuals walking around with cards uh, like this. If you have questions while the speakers are presenting, uh, please give them to those individuals. Then Bill Flanagan, who one day came to one of our meetings and got a permanent job with us as the, uh, as, as, as the handler of questions for the, uh, for the lecture series. Also, in your packet, you will see some information, but one of the most important pieces of that is a, a critique of, of today's event and suggestions that you might want to make for future lectures in this series. Uh, today's lecture is something that, that I found to be very uh, interesting because I've lived a good portion of it. In one portion of my, my career, I was a third-party administrator, and I, m I managed many of the pension funds for the the building trades, the Taft-Hartley pension funds. And I understood back then that um, something, something became very clear to me that when the market is good, pensions are good. They're really good. And I hearken back to the days of like 1983-84 when one of our accounts, the asbestos workers, had coming due a $5 million investment. And at the time, there was this product called the Guaranteed Insurance Contract or Guaranteed uh, Income Contract. And those rates around that time were in the high 18 and 19 percent range. Now, can you even imagine that? And, uh, and so one day, the asbestos workers came to me and said, we have this $5 million to come and do. We want you to find a way uh, for us to get good rates on that. And so we went to the markets and we shopped to find out what we could find. And uh, I came back to the meeting and I said to them, okay, here's the deal. You have $5 million. We can put it out for five years at 19 percent. I thought that was a home run. The, the trustees came back to me and said, wait till tomorrow, you'll get 20. 24 hours later, they got 20%. And then came along 1987. The crash of 1987, which was on the, the anniversary of my 40th birthday, so you can do the math. And, uh, and ever since, defined contribution pension plans have been in a, in a jackpot because the market never got back to those lofty, days. And so here we are today. We've had promises and, and we've had commitments from the employer side and now we can't make it happen. In the, in the public sector, we have a major problem. And here's the issue. Everybody's, everybody's right. Nobody's wrong in this situation. We all were committed to things down the road a long time ago that today we find that the markets don't let us control. And so that's why we decided that we would bring to you today these two speakers who will talk about it from, from the economist's side and let you know what they think for the future. The defined contribution plans are, have started to go away. And that's sad. As Amy told you, I, I retired on Monday with a defined contribution pension plan. So I got in under the wire, didn't I? So uh, I, I hope that you will, uh, you will enjoy this today and, and you will learn something. What we're trying to do is to not solve anything, but we want to begin the debate. Now, these things just don't happen. There are a lot of people that have committed to make these events come true. And uh, certainly the members of the, of the advisory committee, if you please stand up, members of the advisory. Come on, please, come on, Jim, you can stand up. So, so And our newest member, uh, my great friend, Gene Harris, also my next door neighbor and my golf partner. So Gene, thank you for, thank you for being here. Um, I hope that uh, you will continue to come to these sessions. Every one of them has been uh, very worthwhile. Everybody has been happy with them. And I'm sure that our speakers today will not disappoint. It is now my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, somebody who in Pittsburgh generally needs no introduction. The, uh, the International President of, of the United Steelworkers, Mr. Leo Girard. Bob said, try and be funny. <laughs> uh, let, let, me, let me not be funny and say uh, how much I respect the fact that you're here. It's uh, 
a heavy load to carry to ask to come to listen to two economists on a Friday afternoon when you could be somewhere else. And uh, the fact that you're here is uh, testimony to the quality of the two people that we're going to have, but also to your commitment. I just said to Charlie, I said, I think this is our fourth or fifth one. And in fact, this is going to be the fifth uh, labor management forum that we've held and, and lecture series that we've held since we formed it. If we don't count the original trial balloon we had uh, and uh, had turnout about that, it's, it's really uh, interesting. And I, before I introduce the, uh, our panelists and our speakers, it's important that people understand that the uniqueness of, uh, of Pittsburgh and southwestern Pennsylvania. And uh, not long after I got here, I started to uh, see the contradiction what people think outside of the region versus what really has occurred inside the region. I don't think that there's a region in the country where labor and management and government and business and everyone come together and work so hard to try and make this, make this a successful area. And, and there isn't the kind of union animosity that exists and there isn't the kind of business animosity that exists in so many other sectors and so many other regions of the country. And I often point to all of the, all of the construction that's gone on, whether it's a almost a billion dollar project up at ATI, putting in a new Coke battery at US Steel building uh, some of the primary entertainments and sports facilities in the country, all built with union labor, all built on time and under budget. And that's a uh, consideration that people should think about when we're trying to attract more people to Pittsburgh. I want to get that shot in before I introduce the two speakers who may not seem as... Uh, and, and I want to introduce first uh, uh, Stu Hoffman. Stu is the Senior Vice President and Chief Economist for PNC Financial Services Group. Stu, as the Senior Vice President and Chief Economist for the, for the group, serves as its principal spokesperson on economic issues for PNC. Uh, Stu Hoffman is recognized as, has been recognized as the most accurate forecaster in 2004 by Business Week, as the second most accurate, uh, I mean, is that second most? How the hell could that be second most? The second most accurate economic interest rate forecaster so I want to know who came first. Do you can tell us that when you get up here uh, in, in, in USA Today. He graduated from Pennsylvania State University. He received a master's degree in 1973. I heard him and Larry trying to figure out who was older. And, uh, and a doctorate degree in economics in 1975 from both the University of Cincinnati, where he was a Charles Phelps Taft Memorial Fellow. In 2004, the University of Cincinnati honored him as a distinguished alumnus and in 2011 presented him with the Carl Linder Award for Outstanding Business Achievement. Larry, Larry Lawrence Moschel, Larry and uh, I have known each other for a long time. Larry's primary interest is in labor economics, income distribution and poverty, as well as giving advice, labor advice on technology and productivity, wages and collective bargaining advice. Larry is a uh, been a research director at the EPI, the Economic Policy Institute, since 1987. Uh, he's recognized, Dr. Michelle is recognized as co-authored 11 editions of The State of Working America, a book where former Labor Secretary Robert Rice says remains the unrivaled and most trusted source of comprehensive understanding of how working Americans and their families are, are faring in today's economy. The State of Working America has been an invaluable resource in newsrooms, classrooms, and in halls of power in Washington by both parties. Let me say that uh, Larry is a uh, PhD in economics from the University of Wisconsin, MA in economics from American University, and probably where he got his best founding and grounding was that he got a MS in Pennsylvania at the State University, and he's got a BS in a lot of stuff too. So. <laughs> The thing is, he's my friend, and I'm proud of the work that he does. So if I could get Stu and Larry to come up, please. And I think uh, Stu will be first on the agenda. Stu?
Well, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for inviting me to be here. Thank you for the nice words of uh, welcome. Looking forward to uh, de debating or discussing these important issues with Larry. And um, since I get a chance to get it in myself, I'd like to also say how well the economy is doing here in southwestern Pennsylvania. Uh, obviously a very, very important market to PNC, and by the way, to my colleague, Ann, uh, I've got to try to be funny. Um, I could tell you that between the two of us, you'll get uh, three opinions, or I could tell you that there are two types of economists. Well, actually, there are three types of economists. There are those who can count, and there are those who can't count, so those are the three types of economists. So I've, I, I've self-identified myself uh, by that one. But as I said, this, 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 just a minute or two before talking about this important topic, and you know, there's so many different perspectives. As Ann said, there's no shortage of uh, revenue and expenditure mismatches in, in the public sector, at the state level, at the regional level, at the local level, as well as in the uh, certainly in the private industry as well. And I think, indeed, the, the picture of the U.S. economy over the last couple of years has been somewhat of an alternative of that, but it's sort of a deficiency of demand with a lot of variety of reasons. But I can say, uh, you know, my first remarks uh, about this region where many of us live and this university and so many are, and, uh, are located. And I grew up in Pittsburgh, been back at PNC for 33 years. It, it is really heartening to see how our region's economy has really gone through a metamorphosis over the last 10 to 12 years, and labor and management working together in private industry, and certainly the universities. And it was really, really refreshing to see that over the last three years, as the U.S. economy struggled to recover, and is still struggling to recover, although I think moving forward, that there are just a few major metropolitan areas that you could look at the number of people employed today compared to, say, 2007, which was the peak before the 08 and 09 near depression experience, just a handful of metro areas where there are more people working today, where all the jobs lost in 2008 and 2009 have been recouped throughout construction and obviously energy, but also in service sector, finance, uh, Pittsburgh. Southwestern Pennsylvania is one of those handful of metro areas where we have more people working today than we did five years ago, and even more people than we did, as you all know too well, in the early 80s, in the really multi-decade long collapse in the steel industry and heavy manufacturing and the over 100,000 jobs we lost in that period of the 70s into the early 80s. And while it's certainly a different labor force composition, different skills, it's a different world than it was 30 years ago. We are now having more people working in the metropolitan seven, or if you like, 10 counties of southwestern Pennsylvania than ever before, and also working at better wages. And I think that's why this region's unemployment rate is below the national average and has done fairly well. And that that was different for us. I don't need to tell anybody who's been around that it, in the old days when there was a recession at the national level. It was always worse here. And when there was a recovery, it was always much slower. That was the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, and the 80s. That isn't the Pittsburgh of the 90s and hasn't been the Pittsburgh of the past 10 or 12 years. And, and fairly optimistic as I look ahead, whatever the national challenges and issues, that this region, as we go through ebbs and flows of economic ups and downs, will hold its own and will set out a different a pattern of growth and jobs and income and hopefully greater equality of, of that, that income and jobs uh, over time. But now to, to say a few words on the topic and, and then you know have Larry come up and open it up to uh, Q&A and as I said, I'm very pleased to be asked to join you. You know, I was trying to think with my remarks, where do I start? If I, if I go to the broadest level, the federal government, you know, we've had some major policy changes since the so-called fiscal cliff uh, was addressed after the president won re-election. But if you really think about some of, at least at the national level, in dealing with these increased demands 
It's also much decreased revenue. Revenue is growing again. It certainly decreased at the federal level in 08 and 09, but has been growing again, and at many state and local levels, is also growing again as jobs have grown. Uh, I mentioned before, you, uh, Pittsburgh has more people working now than we did in 2007. At the national level, we lost almost 9 million jobs in the 08-09 recession, and with the uh, latest data we got today on a, a smaller than expected increase in jobs, even if you add up the last three plus years of job growth, uh, we've only gotten about two thirds of the jobs that we had in this country uh, three, let's say five years ago, and the length of unemployment. People were un unemployed, the, some of the longest durations of unemployment, and that's something Chairman Bernanke and others have spoken about, the loss to the economy, the loss to those individuals, the loss to society, having people lose their skills, fall behind, and really become detached from sort of the, the workforce or being uh, involved in the economy. So we've gotten two-thirds of the jobs back. So revenues are up. Federal revenues are up, but clearly not up to the where the increases in demands are coming from. And in the broadest terms, and maybe I'm sure Larry maybe will bring it into a bit more detail. I tend to be a big picture guy when no one looking at me that I'm the big picture guy at PNC. But if you look at the national level, uh, you know, our long run trend has been federal revenues as a share of the total around 19 or 20 percent of our economy. Now, in the recession, it fell to like 17 percent. And no doubt some of that was the, the Bush tax hikes of a 15 years ago, I guess, of the early 90s, 13 years ago, and the reduction that had in, in the rate of growth of taxes on some of the upper income individuals. But now we're going to see those revenues rise back up, probably to around 19 or 20 percent. And of course, the big debate is where should the spending side be? In the last couple of years, spending has been 25 percent of the economy. We have a $16 trillion U.S. economy. That's our GDP, and a $4 trillion federal budget. And in fact, the president has just proposed a new budget, or some of the, he hasn't proposed it yet. Some of the details have come out of that, and we'll hear more about it next week. So we have $3 trillion of revenues, $4 trillion of spending. And how do you get to some degree of balance? And I've always sort of felt my own position, I can only speak for myself, not for PNC uh, in, in this regard, that you need to get closer in the balance. And you can't do it all from cutting spending. I don't think we could preserve the social safety net and the education and the infrastructure and the way of life that we have and the support that the government has in many crucial areas. If you talked about cutting the federal budget back down to 20 percent of the economy or a trillion dollars. And sometimes when I hear tea parties or others say, you know, no more tax revenues, we're going to do it all from that side. I think to myself, even as a registered Republican, I, I don't know how you, how you can do that, how you can decrease that kind of uh, spending or that kind of commitment when you do have increased needs. On the other side, I don't see how we can allow spending, or revenues I should say, to go up to 25 percent of the economy. That would be well out of the bounds of what we've been in the last 50 or 60 years. And I do think that in that case, you would begin to lose taxpayers, they would, you'll have more cheating, you'll have more of an underground economy. You know, there's a limit to how high you can raise taxes in a free society. And we've seen Greece and other areas, Italy, where their tax rates are high, the tax compliance is, er, is, is much lower. <laughs> the tax, um, you know, not complying is much higher. So you can raise rates, but then you have to have people complying. So I don't know what the right number is. I don't think it's 25 percent, and I don't think it's 20 percent or 19. But I think we have to get probably to where federal revenues are up a bit to 20 to 21 percent of the economy, and they're on their way there, uh, and, and maybe some additional tax hikes at certain levels would be part of that as well. But at the same time, despite the increased demands, 
looking out, and I'm not talking a year or two, uh, you know, I think we're talking about the year 2020 or the year 2025 to think about where we're going to be. The good news is, in the next couple of years, the budget deficit is actually going to go down. The Congressional Budget Office, our own forecast, show that as the economy grows, to be sure we'd like it to grow faster, but it is growing, uh, we will likely see what was a trillion dollar, over trillion dollar deficit in 08 and 09 and 2010 and 11 come down to probably half that. That's not good enough, but it's certainly some progress in the right direction. And it would mean that our deficit and our debt would grow less rapidly than the overall economy for the next several years. So there is a little bit of time to deal politically with the situation. But probably by 2016, if we don't make some difficult decisions, we, meaning our elected officials, we, the public who elects them, the electorate who put them in office, then the deficit will start to go back up again. And the uh, accumulated debt that will come on top of that will put us into a, a danger zone. Right now, the federal debt as a share of the economy is about 65%. Put that in numbers, we have a $16 trillion economy. We have about a, just close to a $10 trillion privately held debt. So that's about, you know, a little over two thirds, a little under two thirds. A little over, yeah, 10 out of a 16. Um, if 20, if in 10 or 15 years from now, the economy grows to $20 trillion, which is not unreasonable, but our debt has doubled to $20 trillion then I would really be very fearful for our economy because a number of academic studies have shown that typically when the debt of the government, Fed, this is federal, as a share of the economy gets towards 90 or 100 percent, you sort of pass the Rubicon. And that's when you're, you have difficulties really maintaining the standard of living, making the investments, making the educational investments and others. And so, you know, I think at 60 plus percent, we're a ways from that, but Four years or five years ago, it was 40%. We had 40% of the uh, economy representing the federal debt. So it's gone from 40 to 60 plus in a short while, but that was through a very, very difficult economic situation. And I think we did the right thing in terms of the stimulus. Paul Krugman would say we should have done maybe twice as much, and others would have said we should have done none of it. Uh, I, I think the policies, the 800 billion the president proposed that was passed uh, was, the, was, was sort of the right magnitude. Should it have been a little bigger or smaller? I don't know, but it shouldn't have been a lot smaller, and I don't think it should have been doubled in terms of dealing with some of these longer-term economic issues. So that's, you know, that's the dilemma we face as a people, as a country, because it's ultimately what we and our elected officials and what we urge them to do in a still a, a capitalist democratic society. Will I think if, we're on, if we go on a path where over the next five to ten years the spending, even given the increased needs, goes up from 20 or, or stays at 25 percent or goes higher, we are going to be left with a deficit that will become a cancer, corrosive to our, I think, overall economy, to the productivity, to the education, making for a worse, much worse uh, you know, um, distribution of income more at the top, less at the bottom, the, the continued hollowing out of the so-called hollowing out of the middle class. And, you know, I don't know as I have the right answers, and I certainly i am not a policymaker. I, I think the best course for the U.S. economy, as it often is, is some degree of compromise. That includes, as we've already seen, some additional federal revenues and probably some more to come but also some wiser decisions on spending cuts. And sequestration was not a wise decision. And across the board is not the way to do things. It was never really intended to probably occur that way. And it was a, you know, a meat cleaver attempt. And a lot of good things probably got cut and other things were preserved that shouldn't have been. So we need a, a smarter system than a sequestration. That's sort of the last resort of, of a across the board blunt spending cuts. So I would hope in the president's budget and in the Republican response, 
uh, you know, we'll see a, a better detail of more credible spending and some additional infrastructure spending as well as some additional uh, taxes, uh, but probably more towards the middle or upper end. I strongly believe in a progressive tax system, and I'm, I'm not a flat tax guy. I've never quite believed in that. I, I also think a lot of the um, itemized deductions, charitable, a good bit of home ownership should be there, although maybe capped. But I guess my, my final words would be, can we get from this 5 or 6 percent at the federal level mismatch between the share of the economy the federal government spends and the share of the economy that they tax from all of us, if we can't meet in the middle or bridge that gap, the consequences could become quite negative for the economy. Um, I think we can. I think it does require tough choices, but I can't think it can't be done all on reducing and spending given the needs. It can't be done on all increasing taxes given, you know, I think there's a certain, uh, a, a certain willingness of Americans for history in paying certain taxes, but can we sort of grope our way uh, towards the middle? And then, you know, I'll end on, on the note that, uh, to quote Winston Churchill, because any time you do that, you can't, be in, you can't be wrong. He says, you know, we count on you Americans to always do the right thing after you have exhausted all other possibilities. So we've done a few of the wrong things. We got a few more that we need to do, but we basically will have a much better off economy particularly when you think we might become a more energy independent, which is a whole different subject matter, but certainly relates to the performance in the economy and jobs and revenue. But, you know, as an economist, if I think about the prospects of becoming more energy independent and the possibility of dealing by reducing our deficit from 5% of the economy down to 2 or 3%, it doesn't have to be zero, it really doesn't but two or three percent so that it is growing less than the economy is growing and therefore shrinking as a share of the economy. I, I would say we could meet a lot of these increased demands when we think about not the next couple of years, but over the next couple of decades or even generations. So I think the potential is there from some good governance and uh, some good economic management and some good private sector work in the energy sector that while I know you'll hear a lot of doom and gloom and the topic of this conversation is sort of, you know, how are we going to get through this? I'll just sort of end on a, on a slightly positive note that if you combine some real independence and in energy and the innovation and technology, and certainly right here in southwestern Pennsylvania, being sort of in the heart of that in terms of shale gas with a little bit of uh, prudence and compromise on the federal fiscal front, you know, I, I'd say that there's a real opportunity that 10 or 15 or 20 years from now, we might, as we've done so many other times, surprise ourselves on how we've actually grown our economy in a fair and more equitable way and a less decisive way. But I can tell you, as an economist, when I start to feel all that optimistic, I just lie down and I get over it fairly quickly <laughs> and get back to the negatives that we're here to talk about. And on that note, I want to invite Larry up to basically refute or rebut everything that I've just said. Thank you. Yeah, actually, that was very sensible. <laughs> uh, you're exactly the kind of economist I'd love to negotiate with. I could come to an agreement, and, and not just because you're the kind that can't count, and I can count. Um, <laughs> I learned that in bargaining from uh, the steelworkers. Um, anyway, I, thank you. I really appreciate being here at the university. I uh, appreciate Mr. Johnson, Charlie for arranging it all, uh, Leo for uh, inviting me and for being uh, a longtime uh, friend and partner, uh, and for Stu, for the, that, was, that, was, that was thoughtful. Uh, I'm glad to come to Pittsburgh as I'm a, I'm a native Pennsylvanian, I understand Philadelphia is a long way from Pittsburgh, and it's not really the same, but we are in the same state. I root for your teams when my teams are uh, out. Um, uh, I remember uh, finally coming to Pittsburgh the first time in my life when I was age uh, 15 to compete in the uh, statewide 
a table tennis championship, uh, of which I came in second to some kid from Pittsburgh. Um, uh, but he went on to go go to China. Everyone remember he, he was became a champion and eventually went into the Olympics. So you got to lose to the best, right? Um, now I'm at a disadvantage here because I'm an economist, and just like some ethnic groups have to talk with their hands, uh, which I'm like that too. But um, I, I talk with uh, PowerPoint slides, and I don't have PowerPoint slides, although they were distributed. Does anybody? Have my PowerPoint slides? Whoa, 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 okay. Uh, I'll try to talk loosely about them. You might not be able to read them all carefully. Um, and, and I do appreciate, just like Leo said, it's really great for you to come here, economists. Um, you know the definition of an economist. Someone who's good at math but didn't have enough personality to become an accountant. <laughs> so it's great for you to come here and listen to us. Uh, my son, the accountant, tells me I can't tell that joke anymore, but I don't have another economist joke, so I have to. Um, so I am going to address uh, federal budget policy, uh, but I want to do it in the context, in, in, in very much the same spirit as what Stu did. Uh, I, I, think, I think what's distressing about the economic policy discussion in our country is that the only thing you hear about is budget policy. And economic policy is not about budget policy. And budget policy isn't even about budget policy. And that's one of my points. The budget policy is about our priorities as a nation. You have to first decide what kind of nation do we want to live in. Then you need to decide what are the budgets that are going to get us there. We need to have budgets that are sustainable, and I agree with the um, criteria that uh, Stu set out, which is basically a certain small, uh, deficits can be small relative to GDP, two or three percent. They don't have to be balanced. We can talk about that in uh, Q&A to explain that. Um, but the point is that you could have a sustainable budget, you could have a balanced budget in a nation we don't want to live in as well as in a nation we do want to live in. So I want to start with, and, this, and the slideshow starts with, what are some of the things that we the context that we bring to this moment to think about what we need our budget to do. And I just mentioned three things. Uh, one is uh, jobs and income, because I think the biggest crisis we face, I mean, I was on a panel uh, of a conference sponsored by the Pete Peterson Foundation. And the first question I was asked was, uh, are we going to have a crisis because of the budget? I said, well, why are we worrying about a budget crisis? We are in a darn crisis. It's called the jobs crisis. Why are we worrying about a crisis that we may have when, when people are struggling? So to me, jobs is priority number one, and I'll explain how that fits into budget policy. But related to that is income. We have seen falling incomes for a number of years, and the, and the middle class has not fared well for several decades. So the real challenge is, how are we going to get an economy that allows everybody's income to grow? And that's the second challenge that I, I, I mentioned, which is what I would call shared prosperity. And the third thing I mentioned, there's a lot of other things we can go into, is I, I, uh, I mentioned retirement security. And the reason I want to talk about retirement security is because there's a lot of discussion about how to cut so-called entitlements like Medicare or Social Security. But if you're, there's a lot, you could balance the budgets by actually exacerbating retirement insecurity. And our retirement system is in shatter, is, 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 is fragmented, is, is awful. There's not, it's not pretty. And it's not where it should be. And I can't imagine uh, when I sit down and negotiate with Stu, agreeing to any budget policy that would make that harder on anybody who's going to, re uh, a middle class or low income worker who's going to retire. I just can't imagine that being possible. So that's the point number one. We have to decide what kind of uh, nation we want to live in. And, and I want to put it in the context of uh, uh, jobs, income, retirement security, um, et cetera. 
So one of the slides there talks about the job crisis, and uh, we do have a situation where the unemployment rate has gone down for a few years, but mostly because people left the labor force, not because of any rapid job growth. And we still are short 9 million jobs in this economy. We have lost, we don't have as many jobs as we used to, plus the population is a lot bigger, and we don't have enough jobs to absorb the increased population. So we are 9 million jobs short. The Congressional Budget Office says that uh, uh, we can expect the unemployment rate to be 7% at the end of 2015. Uh, you know, the, the unemployment rate we have now is roughly as bad as it got at the worst moments of the last two recessions. So, you know, just because it's down from where it was, this is totally unacceptable. And things that are unaccepted, unacceptable shouldn't be accepted. I think our policymakers and the discussion you read in the newspaper almost accepts this as inevitable or nothing we can do about it. That's just not true. When the unemployment rate is high, it's not just the 7 or 8 percent that are unemployed. There's more people that are underemployed. People who are unemployed now may have a job in a few months and other people that are working be unemployed in a few months. In the course of a year, we're going to have 20 to 25 percent of the workforce unemployed or underemployed. And that's on average. If you're a minority, if you're a blue collar worker, it's going to be much worse. The consequence of the high unemployment is scarring generations of young people that are coming out of school, high school, community college, or college. As I said earlier to some students, you graduate uh, in the middle of a recession, you, uh, you are scarred. You will earn less your entire life. So people who worry about having a higher deficit is hurting our grandchildren are basically saying we're willing to hurt our children and grandchildren now, lest we hurt them in the future. Uh, and I think that's just uh, wrong. And when there's high unemployment, it's also making it hard for everybody else to see rising wages and income, those who even have jobs. So I, I think that's a, a really important um, thing that we have to focus on. Uh, add to that another slide here on, on, on income growth. Let me just point out, where I won't go, have to go into a lot of the numbers, that even in the last business cycle from 2000 to 2007, the income of a typical working class family fell over the course of an entire business cycle, even though we had substantial amount of productivity growth. That's quite an accomplishment. Since 2007, we've been in a recession, and, and the typical family is, is around $5,000 worse off now than before. If you project this forward, we won't, a typical family won't have as much income as in 2007 or 2000. I can't even tell you how many years it's going to be. That's, a, that's what I call a, a, a crisis. I mentioned, uh, I show a chart on wealth. Just to point out that we have now lived with an entire generation where wealth, there's only data back to 1983, but between 1983 and the last year we have data for, 2010, the typical household basically has no more wealth than the typical household had in 1983. So a whole generation has gone by and no wealth uh, gained by a typical household. Uh, I also showed the racial breakdown. Minorities had almost no wealth in 1983, and they had less wealth in 2010. A typical white family in the middle, the middle, a median household, right? 50% had more wealth, 50% had less. Had roughly 95,000 of wealth, 96,000 in 1983, and around 97,000 more recently, up, up $1,300. That, that's, not, that's not much. And that's in the context, which is important. There was a lot of wealth created. It, it just that typical household didn't get any. Uh, I then go on to really reflect what was the theme of Occupy Wall Street, the upper 1% versus the bottom 99%, to show you that from 1979 to 2007, the top 1% saw their incomes grow by 
241%. Th these are data from the radical operation called the Congressional Budget Office. Uh, the middle class family saw income gains of about 19%. Uh, the next chart just shows what the consequence of that was, which is that if you look at all the income growth generated over that period, 38% of it went to the top 1% which was more than what the bottom 90% got. And why does that matter for a discussion about budget policy? It matters for two reasons. One, it just shows you how desperately we need to have an economy where there is shared prosperity, how to think about doing that. And the second thing is, if there's going to be any distribution of the costs, higher revenues, who's going to lose out and have their benefits cuts, it needs to be those who have reaped the gains from the economy over the last uh, 30 years and will, I would expect, continue to uh, have that. So it's very rel relevant. You can't, shouldn't talk about budget policy without that being very much behind us. And similar for wealth. Now, I, I, as an economist, I should distinguish between, between income and wealth because I notice people don't understand those things. So income is like you pay your, t your taxes, you tell the IRS all your wages, all your pension benefits, your alimony, you know, your UI, whatever you got, your income flow over the year, all the different types of income from all the members of the household, from your spouse, your kids, you, that's the household income, okay? Wealth is how much you own versus how much you owe, right? It's your assets minus your liabilities. So wealth is your net worth, okay? So when I'm talking about wealth, I'm talking about net worth. The typical household does not have greater net worth now than before, and the income gains have gone very disproportionately to the top. Now, let me just talk about retirement security, and I say that because I want to point this out, because there's just too many people, in my view, I had to say this politely, um, I think people approach things from their own class perspective. There's a lot of pundits in Washington, and they come from both parties, who tend to think, you know, I, I could keep on working. I'm a, I could sit at the desk another couple of years. Why don't we increase the retirement age? And uh, I think it's just totally abstracted from the real lives of, of most people and what their retirement looks like and what it looks like for them struggling to get to the age of retirement. So let me just motivate that for you a little bit. There's a chart here that says the income composition for the elderly. And the, the main point is that the bottom uh, dark line there, for the most part, is Social Security income. And the point is that for the bottom 60% of elderly, the vast majority of their income is from Social Security. Meaning if Social Security weren't there, they'd be destitute. And many of them aren't doing so well even with Social Security. Flat out. Okay, point one. Point two, next chart, private sector pensions. You know, only half the workforce has any pension, that are, are in a pension plan of any kind. Half, actually less than half. The pensions plans that people are in are now worse than they used to be. They're not the defined benefit plans that have the uh, portfolios that were being talked about investing, where you are guaranteed uh, a certain amount of money for the rest of your life. There are a defined contribution plan where the employer just puts in so much per year and you retire, whatever you, whatever's in there when you retire, good luck, depending upon how many years you live, depending upon what the stock market was when you retire, depending upon whether you were smart enough not to take the money out when you got into trouble, or you got into too much trouble where you had to take the money out, okay? We have a retirement system where most people's retirement is not looking well because their employer pensions aren't as good. Their private, their own savings has gone to the toilet with the housing market. So we, retirement experts talk about a three-legged stool your private pension, you, and you, you're supposed to be able to draw on all these things. Your private pension, your personal savings, and Social Security. 
Well, the only really firm thing in that is Social Security, even though people want to tell you Social Security is going to go bankrupt. Social Security is not going to go bankrupt. The worst that happens is true, 25, 30 years from now, benefits won't be able to be paid as much as what is promised legally. But there's still going to be 75, 80% of the benefits that would be paid. And Social Security is easy to fix. Does everybody realize that in, this, in our system that if you earn over $113,000 this year, you pay no Social Security tax on everything over that? Most people don't know that. The single most popular item in any list, if you give the public, of what we should do would be to raise that amount. You should pay Social Security tax on maybe 160000 maybe 200000 maybe on everything. It is the one thing that is the most popular thing. It is the one thing that doesn't come up in discussion among the pundits. What they want to talk about is raising the retirement age. Now let me show you this next chart, which shows what happened to life expectancy. We all hear that people are living longer. But what do they mean by people? You, should, you can't think about this country unless you also think about class. What this chart shows is that from 1986 until, oh, it doesn't even say. Oh, yeah, 19, 1982 to 2006, life expectancy for the bottom half of uh, wage earners, uh, once you hit 65, you're gonna, you were going to live 15 more years. Now you're going to live 16.1 years. That's good. You get to live another year. Those people in the top half, their years grew by around five years. Now, let me tell you the other thing. In 1983, there was a Social Security Commission that raised the retirement age. Uh, I'm going to retire at age six. I can't get full benefits until sometime when I'm 66. Any, young, any student here that's under age 40, it's going to be 67. What that says is that we've already raised the retirement age more than the increase in life expectancy for the bottom half actually enjoyed. So if you want to raise the retirement age on the lawyers, on the finance people, go ahead. Over my dead body, if you want to raise it on other people. Okay? That's how I feel. That's what I learned in graduate school. That was, uh, okay. Now, let's get talk, now we'll talk about the budget policy. Okay, what, what, I have a chart which shows what, what Stu was talking about, which is that you want to look at the deficit, the, the accumulated public, the, the government debt to the public relative to the size of the economy. Okay? And what you want is for that debt to GDP ratio to be stable or falling. Okay? And what you can see in this chart, it's the 14th chart, is that it, it, it was falling in the 1990s under those spendthrift, those spending spree Democrats. Uh, it started to rise, but not all that much under George W. Bush. Uh, there was a bipartisan lie that George W. Bush actually, uh, the deficits were really, really terrible. The deficit as a share of GDP in 2007 was around 1.3%. So, so um, that's not high. That was low. What that tells you is when we had really high deficits, the trillion dollars that Stu talked about, the reason why we have had high deficits is because we had high unemployment. When people aren't working and paying taxes, when companies aren't producing as much, paying as much in taxes, revenues go down a lot. Expenditures go up some. We have Medicaid goes up, food stamps, unemployment insurance, a few other things. Things that go up in a recession automatically come down when unemployment falls. They're called automatic stabilizers in grad school, right, Lisa? That's a, okay. So that means it's exactly what Stu said. As we have a recovery over the next few years, the deficit is going to fall as unemployment goes down. If we actually wanted the deficit to go down more, we actually it would be better if we had more job growth. Now, ultimately, very... In, in, after the next five, six years, after we get the unemployment rate down a, a bunch, the, the debt is going to go up a little bit, but not really all that much. There's really no economic reason, in my view, why we need to be focused now on 
what the deficit is going to be six, seven, eight, nine, ten years from now. When, in fact, we need jobs. Which means, point blank, we actually should be willing to have somewhat higher deficits now because that will allow us to spend to create jobs. When we do that, some of the money comes back in higher taxes, around 40% of it, okay? So you spend $100 billion, you get $40 billion back. And we actually will get, have a much better budget situation 10 years from now. All the discussion about a grand budget deal, we've already, the next chart shows, we've, we've already uh, done a lot of deficit reduction, uh, around 70% of it by reducing uh, spending, 30% from higher revenues. That's not very uh, balanced in my view. I'm going to skip the next chart, which, but the point of that chart was all, all the, what's been going on at the states in terms of having to deal with their own deficits and what we've done at the federal government this business cycle has been unique in that what's government's happened with government spending has actually made the recovery worse. In all other recoveries, government spending has made things better. Okay, so austerity has been hurting us. The other thing that we've done with the uh, budget deals so far is that we've already locked in low spending in the areas called public investment. Now, I, I, I'm trying to get, get credit for being a nonpartisan uh, think tank here because I'm, I'm trying to show you I'm, uh, I'm fair to both parties and I'm going to shoot at both parties, right? I said something nice about George Bush. Uh, I said uh, something nice about Bill Clinton. Uh, I'm not going to say something bad about President Obama and, and the Republicans. They keep, President Obama keeps on talking about how we need to do public investment roads, bridges, R&D, education, you wouldn't know that, in fact, that area of the budget has already been cut by a third, 33 to 40% over the next 10 years. It's a lie. I, that's quotable, anybody here from the press. It's, it's misleading. He's not rebuilding the middle class by investing. In fact, it's already cut. Now, Paul Ryan, the Republican budget, wants to cut it a lot more. But the reality is that all the spending in the, the domestic area outside of the Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid is going to be a lot smaller uh, in 10 years from now than it is now. Right now, it, it, in, in 2007, it would have been around 3.4% of GDP. It's going to go down to around 2.2% of GDP. Now, that may not, those numbers may not mean any to you except to say that it's a third less. And if we want to have growth, if we want to have modernize our economy, modernize our infrastructure, invest in our universities, invest in R&D, invest in, in healthcare research, we can't have that. So that leads us to the challenge. These are all the challenges. So you need to get the budget under control, sustainable, but we can't do it by savaging our public investments. And we have to do it, and a lot of it is going to take uh, a lot of uh, higher revenue. And in that, I have to say that to call attention to the fact that the Bush tax cuts in the last deal, 84% of them were retained. So any Democrat or Republican wants to complain about the deficit in the future, and that was a bipartisan agreement, should have to explain why is it we can't live with the tax structure of the Clinton years where we had the fastest growth in the post-war period. What is it about that tax structure that was so bad that we had to cut so much revenue? If we hadn't lost that much revenue, there would be no deficit discussion over the next 10 years. None would be needed. Okay. So last, I just want to say there, there are deficit challenges, real challenges about what's going to happen after around 10 years. And the, the chart that I show uh, would be, I don't know what page, it says projected long run fiscal gap fueled by health care. You'll see three lines. One line shows that spending, uh, there's, there's three lines. One is health care programs, 
that line just goes up and up and up. The point being that our problems are really all about health care programs. I'll go back to that. The Social Security line goes up a bit as the baby boomers retire and then is flat. As I said, we can deal with that pretty easily with raising the cap on Social Security. And I'd be glad for um, payroll taxes to go up on everybody a little bit over the next 75 years. And you can make the case pretty easily. If you want to live longer and retire longer, then pay a little bit more while you're working. I, I think the American people would be glad to do it. It'd be a lot more glad to do it than being told they have to work longer to a higher retirement age and to cut Social Security benefits. Okay, but the, so the, the basic problem with our deficits in the long run, there's three, there's three problems. Healthcare, healthcare, and healthcare. And the healthcare problem is not about public budgets. It's about the economy in general. Because if healthcare prices keep on going up, employers will abandon their healthcare plans. It's gonna happen in the private insurance market just as much as the government. So we have a healthcare problem of how to, how to control costs. Now, there's a lot of uncertainty too about how big the problem is. We've had the fortune of the fact that healthcare prices for the last few years have been very moderate. No one really knows how long that'll be sustained. Will that be the future trend or will it not? The idea that we're now going to cut Medicare because we're worried about what the prices of healthcare are gonna be in 2030, we have no idea. We just have no idea. There's prudent things to do and there's really stupid things to do. Uh, and most of the time we're talking about the stupid things. So I think I'm right out of time. Uh, thank you very much. All right, thank you both. Uh, my name is Bill Flanagan. I'm with the Allegheny Conference on Community Development, but I don't think they have uh, invited me to moderate the next part because of my role with the Regional Economic Development Organization. They may ask, ask me to do it because I'm a, an old TV news guy. Uh, and, and if you work in TV news, you tend to live and die by the second uh, because we all know that Brian Williams waits for no local television reporter. Uh, so I'm, my role is to uh, uh, keep this uh, program on time and make sure we all get out of here on time and that our speakers have an opportunity to address your questions as fully as possible within the time allotted. So the way we're going to do this is hopefully uh, uh, you've had an opportunity to fill out cards. I see some folks uh, raising a few of them and we have some... Uh, Individuals uh, walk in the room, uh, looking for those cards. Hold them up. Make sure, uh, make sure they see you've got them. And uh, they'll bring the cards up front, and I will try to sort through them and uh, and uh, address your questions to our two uh, two speakers. So uh, give them a second to do that. Actually, one question I'll start with while we're waiting to gather the cards. And Stuart, maybe you want to pick it up. It sounds like. In, at least in the short run, given the current, uh, the, the, the current state of the economy, is maybe we're paying too much attention to deficits. Maybe we should just run up even more of a tab and put some more people back to the work, and sort of that's how we, we begin to address some of these long-run problems. Do you buy that argument, or how, would you disagree with that proposition? Uh, I think I would disagree with it. Uh, there are a number of you know, things that I'm sure I said and Larry said. A couple of things I disagree with is that uh, a long-run attention on a deficit wouldn't be job-creating. I can tell you that there are many people, business people, who at least say the concern about the deficit, not the next year or two, but over a longer period of time, is one of the things that's preventing them from uh, hiring more people. Some would also say Obama health care, although I, I tend to be in favor of that. We do a, a survey of very small businesses. We just released the results yesterday. This is something we do twice a year. We've been doing the we meeting PNC, and we've seen once again that the cost of health care, either the known cost or the unknown cost of additional health care, at least from a small business's point of view, has been one of the reasons they've been hesitant to hire full-time employees. And there's even this thing, if you get to 50, and we've heard stories about companies that maybe have 40 or 45 people think what you want are saying maybe I'll hire 10 more part-time people 
then five more full-time people because it triggers sort of a new health care cost for me. So I do think addressing the deficit over uh, a medium period of time with a more credible plan out of Washington would be job creation. And I'm not convinced that spending more money now on the deficit, whether it's on uh, the, jo the infrastructure or jobs bank, that Larry said it you know, sort of pays you back 40 cents on the dollar if you spend an extra dollar maybe in, in the first couple of years. But <coughs> if you start adding up on top of the deficit we already have, which is now improving and it begins to go back the other way, uh, from my perspective and uh, from the private sector, that is job killing, not job creating, given everything else that's going on in the economy. Well, I want to use Stuart, Larry Stewart uh, noted in his remarks that, you know, the order of magnitude on the Obama stimulus was probably about right, give or take. I mean, it was appropriate given the current circumstances. How about it? Do you think it was appropriate or was it a failure of leadership to not to go for more money for stimulus? Would we be in a better position had the Obama administration done that? I actually give the uh, stimulus the, coming out of the White House a grade of A minus. Coming out of the Congress would be a B plus. I mean, they took out some of the spending and threw in some tax stuff. And, um, and I think one of the challenges is that the economy, I agree with my friend Paul Krugman that the stimulus needed to be bigger. The problem is that the government can only actually do so much at a time. There's only so many projects you can let out, et cetera. Where I would fault the administration is that I think uh, even later that year in 2009 or early 2010, knowing that the unemployment rate was much worse than you realized because the economy was worse than you thought, that you should have kept going. There's more money could have been provided to the states to provide relief. You know, we're, uh, around a, f a, f a fourth of the jobs hole we're in is because of the cutbacks in the state and local government. That didn't have to happen. Um, and they could have done, done, kept, kept going, done more. Uh, the danger that people have with stimulus sometimes is they're worried about stimulus will still being, be being spent when we have low unemployment. That really wasn't much of a danger uh, in this situation. Uh, we still could use it. So if they had done more that would have taken place in 2010, 11, and 12, that would have been quite appropriate. Uh, kind of related question on, uh, related to the stimulus, because you noted that uh, for all the talk about investing in infrastructure to improve the economy and put people back to work, there's not as much of that happening as, as, uh, as we may have been led to believe. So how much, if any, stimulus for infrastructure should now be provided in your analysis of the current economy to really make the kind of difference that, that needs to happen? Any question for me? Yeah. Uh, well, I think uh, I'll interpret that broadly, how much of a stimulus package, some, some of which is infrastructure, some of which is other stuff, I, I, would, I, would, I would match the original stimulus plan for sure. Uh, and I think that can be done and I think the way to do it, because I think the American people believe that we should do uh, an investment plan, more infrastructure. They tend to distrust a plan that is just about the next few years. So I think we should undertake a, a, a real serious public investment plan that's going to be ongoing. Over the next few years, it would be financed by the deficit. But in the later years, I don't think Stu's going to like this one. Uh, in the later years, it should be financed by a financial transaction tax. Listen, the financial sector got us in this mess. They're making money hands over fists. Um, the, the sector is too big. They don't need to churn as much as they do. We could have a modest financial transactions tax uh, that would then uh, pay for the public investment, that would then make it consistent with appropriate budget policy. Surprise! I don't particularly care for that idea. <laughs> um, and I don't. I'll, I'll ask the clue. When you said you you want a, you would favor spending plans as big as the original. Do you mean the 800 billion or the yeah, part I think of the 800 billion? Not 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 in one year, but yeah. let's say spend that over the next two two and a half years. I I, I don't think the government could manage to spend 800 billion dollars wisely in two or three years, 
And I think to add to the budget deficit, and there's no financial transactions tax that you can impose that would raise anywhere near, because I forget what the profits are of the banking industry, but there may be one-tenth of that. So unless you're going to tax it 100%, in which case you're going to drive it out, uh, maybe we should have tax on higher education. Uh, you know, pick the company you don't like or the institution you don't like the best. But I don't think the numbers add up. I strongly would disagree that another $800 billion, if the private sector saw the government say we're going to propose six, $800 billion deficit finance for the next couple of years and then pay for it, whether it's a financial transactions tax or a higher taxes, I think you'd see a very negative reaction in the financial markets and it would be very counterproductive. And not in the financial markets, but the job markets amongst businesses that would say there's no way that can't require more taxes on everybody and that the government could spend that money wisely and boondoggle would end up in there somewhere uh, at the top of the list of $800 billion. A question, I guess, for either or both of you, uh, you know, c considering the pickle we're in from the standpoint of the national debt right now and the total accumulation, how much of the current debt can be attributed to the war in Iraq and then the decisions that were made over the last decade or so? Either of you? Jump ball, well, whoever wants to take it. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, the, the wars are going to cost, you know, several trillion dollars, you know, both in terms of the actual direct outlays and in the future, you know, one, one of the great things about modern medicine is that a lot more people come back, but they come back injured. And, and so there's a lot of veteran expenses from a war, whereas people used to not come back. That's, I'd rather have them come back. But there's big costs. And um, uh, when people have always, I, mean, I remember, I, I didn't, I thought the, it was a bad foreign policy idea. When people ask me, can we afford the war? I always said, we can afford the war. We can also afford everyone have health insurance and every kid have a good education. So it's just a matter of uh, if you, if you know, why is it that those who sought that war uh, didn't feel any need at all? I mean, at the same time, they wanted to cut corporate taxes cut taxes on capital gains, cut taxes on dividends. And I think that's, um, you know, I don't think you can have it both ways. So I don't think, I don't think it's the major problem, but I think it, it contributed to it. And I think it was bad policy on the fiscal side as well as on foreign policy side. Stuart, any additional? I would agree that with that statement at the end that it was not, it's not the reason we're facing a deficit today. It's absolutely, as Larry said, when the economy collapsed, uh, in 08 and 09, uh, and the revenues dried up and the expenditures uh, that were required uh, is what drove the economy into such deep deficits. To be sure, had we not been in the wars leading up to then, you know, we'd have started from a better position. But the, the deficit problem and the accumulated debt problem uh, is much more due to the weakness of the economy than the war which is a comment on the, the economics of the war, not whether it was advisable, it's public policy or, you know, global policy or whatever. But economically, that was not the source of our deficit problem today, but it didn't help. Interesting. A uh, question, I guess, for both of you. Uh, the, neither economist discussed monetary policy very much. What role, if any, can the Federal Reserve play uh, to uh, further the economic recovery? Well, having worked at the Fed earlier in my career and, and being a a long-time student and observer of monetary policy, uh, I think Chairman Bernanke has done an outstanding job. I think he did back in 08 and 09 and from a monetary policy, and some would say there were regulatory failings, but from a monetary policy, I think he was very aggressive. He continues to provide uh, what's called quantitative monetary easing, $85 billion a month. There have been a lot of people in the markets who've gone on CNBC and elsewhere for years saying this is all going to end up in inflation. Well, it's four years later. There's really no sign of inflation. So maybe it's out there, you know, but so far the consequences, so I strongly disagree with those who have said that this is an inflationary accident waiting to happen. If it is, it's still waiting, and I don't expect it to happen. 
So I think the Federal Reserve has conducted an outstanding monetary policy. I expect looking forward, they will continue to keep interest rates extraordinarily low. Larry mentioned that's a benefit to borrowers and, and, and obviously not to savers. But our forecast is for at least the next two plus years, these extraordinarily low interest rates are going to be there. But probably by next year, the Fed will stop adding this extra $85 billion a month or almost $1 trillion. And I, I, I think it's been the right thing to do. You know, maybe it could be a little less, but I think if you're giving the uh, earlier you gave the administration and the Congress, and I think an A minus and a and a B plus, I would give Bernanke an A in terms of his uh, performance over the last three or four years, and his colleagues as well. But he's led the, the Federal Reserve, so he gets an A in my book. And I meet with Bernanke twice a year. Last time I saw him in January, I told him I had 100 percent. Told him face to face, I have 100 percent confidence in what you've done and that what you'll do to make sure this monetary stimulus does not cause an inflation problem down the road. What I didn't tell him is there's a 40 percent chance my confidence in him is misplaced. <laughs> so you, you, you can do the math because despite what I said, I can, I can multiply. Uh, Larry, how about it? How would you grade the chair? I, I the ditto. Hmm? I agree. You agree? Okay. I mean, I, I can. Same. I could spend two minutes agreeing, but, okay. I, but basically, I, 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 I agree. In that so, case, I changed my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I think what one should say is if you listen to those CNBC people, you would have lost a lot of money. Absolutely. If you listened to him, you would have made money. Huh. Right, a question, though, on this <laughs> issue, uh, and, uh, and Stuart, you, you have lost <laughs> less. <laughs> you expressed confidence that the Fed can manage uh, the, yeah. the interest rate environment and the inflationary environment. I, and one question, though, really speaks to that issue. These interest rates seem to be artificially low by historic standards. How vulnerable are we as a nation, given the amount of debt that we're carrying right now, just in case you're wrong and the Fed screws it up? And that was my addition. That yes, uh, this is the first time for everything. Um, that's one of the top questions that I get asked, because I speak to PNC clients. I give 150 presentations a year at a minimum, and that's often one of the most important questions I get asked. We, yes, interest rates are below inflation. Even as low as inflation is, a 10-year Treasury rate, to use that one, because there's lots of them, but that's sort of a bellwether, is, is under 2%. The inflation rate is right around 2% or maybe a little under. That, as Larry and I both know, over the last 40 or 50 years, is not normal. Interest rates usually are higher than the rate of inflation, and the longer the maturity, the bit higher. So I do expect over maybe not the next two years, but over the next three, four, five years, that 2% 10-year Treasury, which is actually 175 today, uh, actually 170, will probably end up at 3 to 3.5%, 3 but not for several more years. If inflation stays at 2%, if inflation does become a problem, it'll go up more. And I think that is absolutely necessary. It will, of course, raise the cost of the new debt. It doesn't affect the interest rates of debt that was already issued, but as the Fed or as the uh, Treasury has to issue debt in 2016 or 17, but I think people somewhat overestimate the idea that if interest rates go back to what I'll call normal, which is definitely at least a couple of percent higher than they are today, and you figure out what that will cost the government extra interest expense, it is 80 to 100 billion dollars, not money to sneeze at, but it is not a hundred. I often hear people tell me that's going to be hundreds of billions of dollars or trillions of dollars, maybe over 30 years, but that means $100 billion a year, and I think that's in, within the manageable range, and indeed we expect that to happen, it has some investment implication, because when interest rates go up, bond prices go down, so wearing my PNC asset manager's hat, we like stocks, we like bonds, but we like stocks better over the next several years, because we think the three to five year outlook for stock prices is better for bond prices that will go down a couple of years from now when interest rates, I say, inevitably go back up. I had to say that, you know, the person, was it, un, they said interest rates are unnaturally low? Unnaturally low. I yeah, think. I mean, what's unnatural about our economy is high persistent unemployment. Interest rates are low because we're, we're still operating five, six percent below capacity. That's true. And that's what's unnatural. Yeah, can I ask you guys that? Yeah, I, I often, just one last, I, and to agree with Larry on that, I often think of the interest rate as sort of like the, uh, think of it as a vital sign of the economy, sort of like the heartbeat of the pulse. 
normal, when the economy's healthy, interest rates will be 3 4% higher. When the economy's still anemic, the heartbeat is low. And low interest rates are a reflection of an improving economy, but still one that is far from healthy, as reflected in the unemployment rate, which has been improving, but is still, you know, several percent away, which means millions of people away from being closer to normal or being closer to a healthy level. And as the economy's health improves, its heartbeat will improve, in this case, the pace or the rate of interest. Okay, can, uh, speaking of the unemployment rate, though, can you guys explain to me? I re remember, like, years and years ago, and I was a business reporter for 20 years before I sold out and went into PR. Uh, but, um, you know, it always, like, years ago, they said, oh, 4%, that's when there's, that's acceptable, that's sort of the structural rate of unemployment, that's a healthy economy, it's a balance between labor and supply. And uh, few, time went by, and suddenly it was like, oh, 5%, you know, that's okay, We're gonna, we can live with that, that's the right number. Then I remember... 10 or 15 years ago, 6% is probably fine, you know, that, and I'm hearing that a lot now. If we just get to 6%, we'd all be okay. That's sort of the new natural rate of unemployment. What is, what is the rate we should all be willing to accept as a nation? Well, I have, I have strong views on this, and I've and, um, and been studying this my, my entire career because I'm a, I'm a labor market economist. Um, and it's not just the unemployment rate, it's actually a, another s sleeper issue behind that, which is uh, what is the labor force participation rate behind that? What I mean by that is so many people have dropped out. And we don't really know when the economy uh, gets better how many people will come back or could come back. I, I think they all can come back if they want. Some of the decline reflects the aging of the population and so there's some reason to believe that some of it is long-going, demographic, structural, but most of it is because we have a lousy economy. So, you know, what is the unemployment with what participation rate is, is, a, is an issue that's going to be increasingly prominent over the next two, three, four years. My view uh, is uh, that we had 3.9% uh, unemployment at the end of the 1990s. It was at 4.3, 4.4 the end, and in spring of 2007. And neither one of those times was there any kind of inflation problem. I mean, my view of economic policy, you run it until we get the unemployment rate, keep on letting it go down. If inflation starts peering its head, then we put on the brakes. Uh, it's not a big deal. There's no genie about to come out of the bottle and uh, eat us alive. Uh, so I don't think anything is happened that really ch should change our view of that. And I say this because I would just reference an article in the Wall Street Journal from the year 2000 when it was talking about how businesses couldn't find enough ex-felons to hire. So if, 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 if you had the unemployment rate down low, business will hire, I mean the idea that, that people are, 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 are going to have lost their skills and we can't get them back in the workforce, really. This is Larry's chance to uh, change his mind because I agree with him. <laughs> and, uh, I, I don't know about 4%. I, you know, you're right, it's not the right number. Six is way too high. Hmm. I believe the U.S. economy has the capability and with some wise public policies and in the private sector that whether the number is four or four and a half or five, it's not six. And, uh, you know, we used to talk about natural rate of unemployment, but that rate is dependent upon so many things. But I see no reason why the internal U.S. economy with the entrepreneurship, the education, and some energy independence, we couldn't get the unemployment rate back under 5% with a participation rate higher than it is now uh, so that it's not a hollow victory to say we got it there because we counted everybody as... Uh, out of, you know, unemployed because they dropped out of the statistics. I, uh, this is a labor management forum, uh, and the next question really relates to, I guess, some of the, the, the sort of the context of this event. I guess this is more uh, for, for Larry. You know, what is the relationship, or is there a relationship, between the decline of the, quote, middle class and, and the decline in participation in collective bargaining participation in the civilian labor force? Is that a big driver, or is it more these fundamental economic issues we've been dealing with? Uh, I think the the uh, weakness of the labor movement, the decline of collective bargaining, 
is a threat to our uh, ability to have an economy of shared prosperity and to have a democracy. Full stop. Um, and I think, it, I, I think the problem we've had over 30 years or more, of which the collective bargaining question is a part, let me put it in, in a bigger picture, which is that we've had economic policy, which, uh, okay, the nice way to say it is that the economics was oriented towards, we're gonna make people better off because we're gonna make them better off as consumers. We're gonna deregulate, we're going to try to lower costs, be more competitive, and make people better off. Lower prices. Bring in foreign goods. Um, the, what we've done, though, is all those different policies of weakening unions, lowering the minimum wage, globalizing with a corporate perspective. There's ways to globalize and not ways to globalize. Uh, deregulate industries the way we've done the trucking and airlines, etc has been to eliminate the possibility of good jobs. And so now p their prices are cheaper, but no one can afford to buy a damn thing. And their incomes are lower. And I think we've, we have a, a misguided policy. We, we, you know, job quality and the ability of people to earn a decent living uh, should be the central focus of economic policy. And the way our economy has been going in the last 10 years is that there's almost no level of the workforce that's doing well. Uh, at the very bottom of the workforce, uh, immigrant workers are exploited. They have problems of wage theft where they work and have a hard time sometimes getting paid for the work they do. Or, or, or people actually absolutely paying the minimum wage when it's actually due. Uh, at the top end, you have people who are cheated out of overtime. You have college kids working for free, which by the way is illegal for the most part. College kids working for free in the private sector if they're not doing it for the, mostly for their benefit, if they're doing the same work as the person next to them that's getting paid, it's illegal. The fact that we have such I thought such that was called practices. internship. What? Yeah. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just calling it like it is. Uh, so, you know, uh, white, uh, white, uh, college graduate wages haven't grown faster than inflation in 10 years. The bottom 70% of the college graduate workforce is worse off now than 10 years ago. So we, we basically have a problem of not good quality jobs for almost every segment of the workforce and policies which only seek to exacerbate that. And we have to turn that around. Hmm. Uh, and, and collective bargaining is part of that. And, uh, you know, and it's part of the political economy too. Because if we had a labor movement that was as size it was in 1970, we would have had a better jobs policy too. We would have had a much better health insurance plan that came out of the Congress, too. The stupid policies about whether you're mandated, about whether you're over 50 employees or not, that's stupid. I mean, we should have a we should have a where's Leo? He's not, he had to leave, like Canada. You get health care, you know, a certain amount of, uh, it's a payroll tax, everybody gets health care. Doesn't matter whether you're like 20 employees, doesn't matter whether you're 50 employees, you know, we, 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 we just, go through so much rigmarole to get around the fact that we could have Medicare for all. Call it what you want. Medicare for all. Everybody likes Medicare. Well, uh, and I actually got several questions about health care, so I want to move on to that in a second. But first, in a, a, another jump ball, either of you can take it up. I think Larry might want to. Uh, what is your opinion of right to work? Well, people may not even know what that is because it's misnamed. I believe in the right to work. I believe everybody should be able to have a job. I actually believe the government should be the employer of last resort, but that's not what right to work is. Right to work is laws that are passed in states uh, that uh, prohibit collective bargaining agreements from having uh, everybody covered by the agreement have to pay uh, an agency uh, a fee, either be a union member or pay a fee for benefiting from the collective bargaining agreement. And th the only reason that this is done is to, in fact, weaken uh, collective bargaining. Uh, it's the same as saying uh, everybody who lives in Pennsylvania doesn't have to pay. You know, you can pay Pennsylvania taxes if you feel like it. I mean, it's, 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 uh, it's about weakening uh, unions as a political force. It's about weakening them, weakening them at the bargaining table. And, g and given the trends that we have, that's, that would be the last thing on my list. Right. We'll uh, uh, 
tackle a couple of the health care and social security related questions because those are the big long term issues. Larry says social security is pretty fixable, a much less significant issue uh, looking forward than, than, than health care uh, is in many ways. But I wonder, sir, one of the things uh, Larry put forward as a social security fix was just raising, raising the cap on income. So what do you think about that idea? And do you, re do you agree with him that social security with some tweaks is probably something that's sound and we can trust? Well, first off, we do raise the cap because we adjust it for inflation. I know Larry's talking about you know, a well, every much year. bigger one time, you know, pick a much higher number, and then I guess adjust that for inflation. So it, 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 does, it does go up with the inflation rate. Uh, uh, so that's one small adjustment that didn't used to be there. Uh, we did that with Medicare probably about 25 years ago. We took the there was a time there was a cap on your Medicare payment that um, – was then unlimited. That's why you see that big disparity on your That's W two, right? Your social security income your is social security your caps out at out whatever out. level. And Some now of us with the rate back <laughs> up at six point three, uh, and um, I I would I would much rather means test by that. If you have social security, you ought to pay taxes on it. There shouldn't be any tax preference. Maybe there should be some income levels that if your other income other than social security is a certain level. You don't get Social Security, sort of the so-called Buffett, you know, I, I don't need it type of thing. But I guess my question would be I'd, I'd have to do the math on how much do you have to increase the payroll tax, or, or in this case, the, the income level that you pay it up to, sort of as a one-time or over a sliding scale over a number of years, to where you can make Social Security, quote, solvent for the next 50 years. And, you know, there are people who are, are making 110 or 15 or 20 or 30 thousand dollars that actually look forward <laughs> to that amount getting capped, sure. and that use that income uh, that's not paid in taxes to do something in their family to spend it the way they want to. So I would be opposed to what I would call a large, what I would think would be a large increase in the the maximum, and then adjusting that for inflation that would raise, if you're talking hundreds of billions of dollars over the next 10 years uh, to supposedly shore up the Social Security system. Because frankly, we know, I agree with Larry, you're going to get Social Security. It may not be as generous as it is now, but there is a, it's not really Social Security. It's, it's all those taxes go in to fund the government. So it would be raising that limit would really just be another tax hike on, I don't know if you call that middle income or not, but if you're making $110,000 and you're going to not pay taxes because you make $140,000 and now you're going to pay taxes on that extra thirty, maybe that's not middle income. I would say people in New York and California would say making $120,000, dollars might very much be middle income. So you're going to tax middle income workers by making that tax rate up. And now if you want to eliminate it, of course you'll have much more taxes on on wealthier individuals whose incomes are many multiple times that. But I would see that as just another way of, uh, of taxing middle and upper income individuals. And uh, I would therefore not be in favor of it. But I, I do think that letting it adjust over time for Social Security means testing the income that people get, Social Security payments. And I might even be willing to go with retirement age for fat bankers like me who can work another year at the and sit at our desk was, I think, the implication. But you know, there are certain probably professions where maybe the minimum, the uh, the age of retirement, full retirement, could go up, given life expectancy increases, even if it wasn't across the board. Although we've never, at this point, had a type of occupational distinction between when you can get full Social Security and when you you want. And I'll agree. There's a lot of micromanagement and saying lawyers and accountants and economists and I would say think tanks and uh, <laughs> uh, academic professionals should be able to work a little longer because what we do isn't as physically quote risk for a whole new set of lobbyists for yeah. all of those professionals. Let me just come out a little bit. Um, yeah. You know, the, it is 113,000 uh, this year that you, you stop paying. Social Security taxes, or the FICA, the, the yeah, FICA, part, the FICA portion. not the not the Medicare part. Six point two. Um, there's only six percent of the workforce that actually uh, makes more than that. 
So when I say raise the cap, I'm only, it would only affect 6% of the workforce. And that really lets you know how, what the real wage structure is in this uh, economy. Now, some of my friends would say eliminate the cap altogether. I, I actually uh, don't like that idea uh, because I think that it's a social, Social Security is social insurance. There has to be some relationship between what you pay in and what you get. It should be progressive, but there should be some relationship to it. So I would want to raise the uh, cap much faster than inflation, and it should be up to 160 or 170,000, maybe make that happen over the next 10 years. Uh, I, I think that we, 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 we should allow, we should also have Every worker can pay a, a few, you know, up the payroll tax a little bit over the next 75 years. And we had it, that happen in the 1980s. Uh, we can do it le much less than that. The idea of means testing is attractive. Uh, I understand the logic. But when you actually cost it out, like, what, what it turns out is means testing can save you a lot of money, meaning that people who make a certain amount of uh, income don't get as much Social Security or it gets taxed. But then you start getting it, having to find like, well, who is the, where does the middle class stop, and when is the top people that should be cut? And what it ends up happening when you look at all the actual proposals, I'm not saying that's yours, they, they really end up cutting benefits for a typical middle class worker. And if you're just going to cut the benefits for people in the upper five, ten percent, you actually don't save hardly any money. So there's really not much of a savings there, yeah, you know. So. It really depends, and I and I and, and I think Stu did the best critique of his own plan to have differentiated retirement age. Is that one of the nice things about Social Security is it's universal. You go to the office, you you don't even go to the office anymore. You get online, you sign up, you get it. You know how are we going to determine who? What bureaucracy are we going to have that's going to determine who retires at age 69, who retires at age 67, who retires at age 65? You know, I'm sure. Uh, you know, the people who talk about that, I'm not saying this is Stu because it's not your, you're not a policy guy, you're a, a banker guy, but they don't really take it enough seriously where they actually come up with a plan. They just like to say, well, we can do something that's going to protect those who need protection. But if they really cared, they'd come up with a plan. They don't, therefore, I surmise, they don't really care. All right. Well, on that note, uh, I've got lots more questions, but we have no more time. Uh, fortunately, our, our two speakers uh, can stay around for a little bit after the program, so hopefully you can Thank call them much. individually Thank during you. our during our reception. But like, a, how about a round of applause for Stu and Larry? That's great. And now it's my pleasure to turn things over to uh, Dr. Johnson for a few closing remarks. Let's uh, also extend a round of applause for Bill and the outstanding job that he, that he always does. Uh, we want to uh, extend, uh, once again, our sincere appreciation to Dr. Hoffman and to Dr. Michelle for the uh, wonderful and provocative conversation uh, that they provided us this afternoon. I want to thank all of you uh, for your questions. And uh, this is certainly uh, grist for the mill. Uh, there are opportunities in the future con to consider dialogues that uh, reflect labor and management. Uh, in fact, on May 28th, we will have another conversation around cybersecurity uh, and uh, uh, labor management and a national presence uh, in Greater Pittsburgh. Uh, once again, we want to thank all of you so very much for being here. And on behalf of a grateful Labor Management Institute and CCAC community, we want to thank you guys for being here this evening. I guess I should. I guess I should have gotten three. Yes. Oh yes. Uh, I've been. Uh, I've been reminded that the advisory committee uh, will join Dr. Hoffman and Dr. Michelle for uh, pictures. And uh, let me also uh, on the stage. And let me also thank um, Charlie and Joan and Bev. And uh, did I miss someone? And I'm sorry, how could I miss Ann? Ann Tansky uh, for their involvement in this process and all the wonderful work uh, that they do to get these things up and running and moving. So once again, thank all of you so very, very much. And I look forward to seeing you again on May 28th for our discussion on cybersecurity. Thank you so much.